Anybody who's been reading the Washington Post over the past 20 years or so and following its military coverage will recognize the name Steve Vogel. Uh, back in the early 1990s, Steve covered the first Gulf War for the Post. Uh, he went on to report on military operations in Somalia, Rwanda, and the Balkans. Uh, and later, he contributed significantly to the Post's coverage of the 9-11 attack on the Pentagon and of the Pentagon's subsequent reconstruction. He's also done stints as an embedded reporter with U.S. troops in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Six years ago, Steve showed he could do history as well, publishing an acclaimed book on the Pentagon that wove together the architectural and military stories of that iconic building. Now he's gone even farther back in time to the War of 1812. His new book, Through the Perilous Fight, chronicles the closing weeks of that war when the British invaded the Chesapeake, burned uh, many of the public buildings in Washington, and then tried to take Baltimore. The assault on Baltimore, of course, ended up rallying the Americans. It also provided inspiration for the writing of the Star Spangled Banner by Francis Scott Key, who watched the bombing or the bombarding of Fort McHenry from aboard a British ship where he'd been confined. Steve doesn't just bring us the strategies and accidents of battle, but also writes vividly about the personalities on both the British and American sides. He weaves in as well what was happening in the negotiations in, in Europe, in Ghent, to end the war. In a review in the Washington Times, Gary Anderson, a retired Marine officer, called the book the best piece of military history he's read in the past few years. He added that no one who hears the national anthem at a ball game will ever think of it the same way after reading this book, nor want the national anthem changed. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Steve Ogle. Thanks very much. Um, what, what Brad didn't mention uh, was that uh, when I was a stringer over in Germany, he was my first editor. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I have to admit I was a bit in intimidated over the phone the first few times we spoke. Um, he, kind of a, a brusque, no-nonsense uh, demeanor. Um, and it wasn't until I got back to D.C. years later that I realized he was actually a very nice guy. <laughs> But uh, I will say that if I'd known you were going to end up owning uh, politics and prose, I would have tried to file my stories earlier. <laughs> I'm taking full credit for all this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really a, a huge honor to be here. Um, and I was thinking uh, on the on the drive up here that uh, um, once again, just about everywhere I've gone to talk about this book, um, we happen to be within striking distance of of some incident in the, uh, the burning of Washington or the, uh, the attack on Baltimore. And we're, we, of course, are pretty close to Tenley Town here. And uh, this, uh, not a great glorious uh, uh, mark or anything like that, but this is where the American army retreated after um, being defeated at Bladensburg as the British started burning the city. Uh, they were camped out just a, a few blocks from here. So uh, I don't see any historic markers up yet, but uh, maybe one day. I'll get into a little more detail about that a little bit later on. You know, this is actually uh, pretty true of uh, a lot of the War of 1812, uh, where we know little bits and pieces about it, but uh, a lot of the stories and, and the, um, really the, the chain of events has been lost. Uh, a lot of people have, uh, you know, we, we sort of have this image of uh, Francis Scott Key somehow being beamed down from outer space and witnessing the bombardment of Fort McHenry. and. Uh, Dolly Madison saving the portrait of, of George Washington, and then somehow uh, Andrew Jackson uh, saves New Orleans. And the, the, the chain of events that tie these, these uh, stories together and the, the full stories I, I just found kind of remarkable, especially growing up around here. I grew up in Alexandria uh, across the river where you just, every, you know, everywhere you go, you, you bump into Civil War markers or, or, or Civil War this and Civil War that, and you didn't hear much about the fact that Alexandria capitulated to the British in the War of 1812, it somehow that was overlooked. And the same thing about the burning of Washington. We, we really don't uh, hear as much about it as uh, probably we should. 
um, a lot of the, the details about the war tend to be um, misunderstood or, or not fully understood. I, I think, you know, one of the things about the burning of Washington is there, there tends to be a, um, a feeling that um, the British came here uh, as an act of revenge, essentially, because the Americans had, had burnt Toronto. That was uh, formerly known as York, parliamentary uh, capital of Ontario. And that's one of the, the stories you often hear trotted out. And as I explain in the book, um, the, the real reason that the British came to, to uh, Washington was uh, a gentleman named Rear Admiral George Coburn. Uh, he was the, uh, in charge of a Royal Naval, uh, Navy squadron that arrived in the, the Chesapeake almost exactly 200 years ago in uh, uh, March, April of, two of uh, 1813. And uh, he would launch a, uh, a chain of events and a campaign of terror that would culminate in uh, the burning of Washington and, and the battle for, for Baltimore. Just to tell you a little bit about Coburn, because he is uh, one of the, the key figures in, in the book, along with Francis Scott Key, who I, I, I try to uh, take through this entire narrative, and James Madison, a um, few other characters like that. Uh, but uh, Coburn uh, was really the, the uh, I'd say, the inspiration for the attack on Washington. Um, he, um, when he arrived in the, in the Chesapeake, he'd been sent here basically to, to um, heat things up a bit. The, um, the war, until he arrived, uh, it, was, it was said uh, that uh, until George Coburn arrived in the Chesapeake, uh, most people in this area would have only known by hearsay that there was a war going on. And uh, Coburn was going to change that. The uh, a little background on the war, um, it had, of course, started in 1812, a, a pretty poor name for, for the war, by the way, since it went on for nearly three years. But um, the, uh, the war really stemmed out of uh, frustration on the part of the United States at British trampling of American sovereignty. And President Madison and uh, a uh, small majority of Congress had come to the conclusion that uh, the United States was essentially going to remain a, a vassal state of Great Britain if we didn't do something to, to stop the trampling of uh, American rights. The, of course, uh, the, the war has to be viewed in the context of what was going on in Europe. And uh, Great Britain and France had essentially been at war for nearly 20 years at this point, first uh, with, with um, revolutionary France, uh, and then after Napoleon's rise, uh, this titanic struggle on the continent. Uh, and Great Britain, I, I, I see some comparisons uh, actually between uh, Great Britain and the United States post 9-11 in that uh, Great Britain had pretty much adopted you're either with us or against us type uh, attitude. They, they were fighting uh, what they viewed as the, the greatest threat to the world that had ever existed in Napoleon. And uh, um, the United States complaining that its rights were being uh, abused was was never <laughs> going to be very high on their their priorities. They they had a pretty condescending attitude towards towards the whole thing, and uh, they were stopping American ships uh, at sea, impressing sailors. Uh, they uh, really wouldn't allow the United States to tr uh, to trade with France or continental Europe. There were there were a lot of restrictions on on trade, and um, at the same time, the the war was by no means uh, uh, something that was fully supported uh, in the United States. In fact, I mean, this was America's first war of choice, and um, it, uh, a lot of Americans thought that America had made a very bad choice. And um, among them, ironically, was Francis Scott Key, uh, who um, was uh, an attorney here in Washington, uh, living down in Georgetown. And he, like a lot of Americans, was, was appalled at the decision to go to war, uh, the closest vote in uh, history of Congress in terms of declaring war. Uh, he, he wrote to his friend uh, John Randolph of Virginia, congressman, uh, after the United States invasion of, of uh, Quebec had failed. He wrote, uh, he, he sent a, a, a note rejoicing the U.S. invasion had failed to, uh, to Randolph, saying, this I suppose is treason, but as your Patrick Henry said, if it be treason, I glory in the name of traitor. 
I've been imagining if uh, Francis Scott Key had tweeted that today, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, I could see it on the, the, you know, the cable talk shows, uh, Francis Scott Key, you know, traitor or patriot, and probably the votes would have been for the former. So, um, but this, this was really the, the atmosphere in, in America at that time. It was, um, as, as Key called it himself, uh, radically vicious times. We, we, uh, we sometimes think it, our, our political discourse today is unparalleled in its savagery, but uh, um, it, was, it was quite ugly back then. Um, the war had gone badly for the United States from the beginning, but it had also gone badly for Great Britain. Um, because they were so focused on defeating France, they hadn't been able to devote much in the way of resources. And uh, uh, they had troops up in Canada, of course, um, along with uh, Canadians, uh, Canada then being, of course, a, uh, uh, several colonies that uh, were part of British North America. But uh, until Coburn's arrival, uh, very little had happened in this region. And Coburn uh, launched this campaign of terror that uh, I liken to uh, that of, of William Tecumseh Sherman half a century later, the, a form of total warfare uh, against the, the Chesapeake countryside, burning plantations, burning towns. Um, very critically, he, uh, they were attracting slaves to to uh, escape and join the British side. This is a fascinating side story of this, of this whole tale. Uh, and this was, was something that was very uh, terrifying for uh, many Virginians and, and people in Maryland at that time because uh, slaves and, and the numbers of thousands were, were going over to the British side. They were being trained as Royal Marines, you know, put in red uniforms. Out. They were training them on Tangier Island in the middle of, of the the Chesapeake, and they turned out to be not only very effective fighters, but you know, great scouts. They knew the waters and, and back roads better than anybody. And beyond that, they, they were just uh, an agent of terror because uh, every every homeowner plantation was was a, they were afraid to, to send their men to join in the defense of Washington because uh, they knew that uh, their own slaves might be. Uh, uh, might be joining in the attack, and uh, they were afraid to, to sleep at night. Um, Coburn very quickly, after his arrival, began to sense that he could do a lot more than just launch these raids uh, up and down the Potomac and uh, Patuxent Rivers and uh, up the Chesapeake. He, he very soon after arriving in 1813 began advocating for uh, an attack on Washington. He, uh, in, in fact, uh, sent a note uh, to his superior saying that uh, you know, within 48 hours, if you give me enough troops, we could, we could own the capital of the United States. And uh, um, eventually, uh, after about a year of operating down here, in, uh, in the spring of 1814, uh, the uh, war in Europe takes a dramatic turn in uh, the abdication of Napoleon. Now, this was something that Madison and you know the great war hawks in Congress hadn't really anticipated. They'd, the whole American strategy had been based on the idea, well, Great Britain's going to be too tied up with France to to um, really monkey with us, and you know so we can take over Canada and use that as a bargaining chip and and force Great Britain to take us seriously. And it hadn't worked that way. The the fail, uh, you know, the, all the uh, invasions of of, um, of Canada had ended in a humiliating failure, and then Napoleon abdicates, and suddenly Great Britain turns its attention over to uh, North America, and uh, Coburn, Coburn's uh, request for troops was suddenly given a lot more uh, prominence. And in, in the summer of 1814, the, uh, uh, a large portion, uh, about 10,000 troops in all, were being sent to North America from Wellington's army. Um, and some of them were sent up to France to, to help with the defenses up there and to launch an invasion from Canada into New York. And then another 4,000 or so were sent to uh, the Chesapeake under uh, Admiral uh, Cochrane, who was uh, Coburn's uh, superior officer, the commander of the North American Station. And these troops uh, were under uh, General Robert Ross, who was uh, uh, one of Wellington's uh, finest lieutenants, a very brave, charismatic officer. 
Um, one of the fun things, uh, Brad and I were talking about this a little bit beforehand, was going over, uh, for me, the research of the, of the book was going over to Northern Ireland, going through his papers, and actually met some of his descendants and went over to their, their home. They had this wonderful portrait of, of Ross and his, and his red coat uh, in the foyer, and also some swords uh, were hanging uh, up there, too. And the Stephen Campbell, who is the, uh, I guess, uh, seventh generation descendant of uh, Ross, was showing me around. Then he said, well, the problem with having the swords here, when I was about seven, I, I picked up one of the swords and kind of flung it and ended up in the portrait. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that portrait was actually here at the National Portrait Gallery. There was a wonderful exhibit down there, um, along with a great portrait of um, Admiral Coburn. Um, the uh, Coburn had uh, submitted this uh, secret plan for the capture of Washington. Um, and when the, the troops arrived from Wellington's army, uh, they, uh, they sailed from Bermuda into the Chesapeake and uh, arriving in the Chesapeake in mid-August 1814. Coburn's uh, idea all along was that uh, the Potomac was the obvious route to Washington, but the Patuxent was offered the, the back way and a way to fool the Americans. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's important to, to uh, look at a map uh, to, to fully understand the, the, the war uh, that was being um, waged by the British in the Chesapeake, because the Chesapeake essentially served as a highway for the British. It was a British lake, and all the different rivers running out of the Chesapeake were the, the roads that they could take. Um, American troops were uh, basically, bar, by and large, up on the uh, Canadian frontier this entire time. So we were dependent on uh, militia in this region to defend Washington or Baltimore. And uh, as I'd mentioned, the militia were, were more concerned with defending their homes uh, from all these uh, attacks by Coburn in fear of, of slave uprisings. So uh, Coburn's plan uh, basically called for sending a feint up the Potomac River. Send one squadron up the Potomac under Captain Gordon, one of uh, another uh, accomplished uh, British mariner who was part of this force. Another force under Captain Peter Parker, true name, um, went up, uh, would go up the, the Chesapeake uh, past Baltimore to sort of draw off American attention in that direction. And then the main attack force with the army would go up the Patuxent. And this uh, going up the Patuxent would, would uh, really confuse the Americans, Coburn thought. And Coburn, by the way, had a very dismissive attitude to the Americans. He thought it wouldn't be very hard to uh, confuse them. And uh, he turned out to be quite right on that. <laughs> um, by going up the Patuxent, it could mean an attack on Annapolis, it could mean an attack on Baltimore, or it could mean that the British were merely going after Commodore Joshua Barney, who had a was operating with this flotilla of uh, shallow draft barges, um, mosquito-type fleet that had been put together as some sort of defense against the British and was now trapped in the Patuxent. Um, so on August 19th of, uh, of 1814, the, uh, this, f this large force of 4,000 men land at Benedict, which is about halfway up the bay uh, from uh, from the bay towards Washington, about 60 miles from here in southern Maryland. And uh, the Americans had, had been dithering this entire time as to what to do. We had a, a militia commander, General uh, William Winder, who was essentially a political appointee uh, of Madison's, really not at all um, capable of um, making these decisions on his own. He had a Secretary of, of War, John Armstrong, who was completely dismissive of the idea of the, the British attacking Washington. He, uh, he considered Washington a sheep walk. Uh, we, we still hear that today, but uh, he really did, and literally, uh, he thought that was the most useful uh, purpose Washington could serve. He thought Baltimore was, you know, Baltimore was a, a city of 40,000 people, uh, the third largest city in America, a real center of, uh, of commerce, uh, and also a center of all the privateer operations against the British ships. And Baltimore seemed to be a much more likely target. So they couldn't take an attack on Washington seriously. Um, and they also thought the British wouldn't be able to, 
to take their ships far enough up the rivers to, to really uh, mount much of a threat. But uh, the British uh, uh, mariners proved uh, uh, much better sailors than the Americans had anticipated, and they were able to get past the shoals uh, both on the Potomac, where one squadron was coming up, and they were able to come far up the Patuxent as well. Uh, the force uh, did a number of feints uh, that, again, paralyzed the Americans. Uh, they, would, they would send uh, troops in one direction, then double back, and uh, the net result was uh, by the time they had reached Upper Marlboro, uh, basically about 15 miles from the capital, the Americans had really done nothing to mobilize their forces. The militia that had been gathered was still basically sitting in Washington. They were waiting for uh, more instructions from, uh, from uh, General Winder as to what to do. They had some forces that had come down from Baltimore that were in Bladensburg, and uh, the rest of them were camped right outside of uh, Washington uh, awaiting the, the British approach. And uh, by the time that the, the Americans realized that the, uh, the British were, were going to uh, take a, a northern route into the city via Bladensburg, it was really uh, too late. They, uh, on August 24th, the uh, American forces were raced up there uh, when, when the, the Americans learned that the, the British were approaching from that direction. And they were literally still arriving on the, on the battleground there as the British arrived. And uh, had there been a, a more cohesive defense um, set up, uh, the, the outcome of the, the battle there could have been quite different. You know, the, uh, the Battle of Bladensburg, uh, what we hear about that today is, uh, you know, the Bladensburg race is a, a real joke and, and uh, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to, to make fun of the Americans uh, who fought there. Um, they did run, and by the way, if we have Baltimore partisans here uh, who say, well, of course, uh, Washington collapsed before the, uh, before the British, but Baltimore de defended them, uh, you know, we're, we're the, we were much more, uh, we're better cities. It was basically what you hear. And that may or may not be true, but I will point out that the first troops that ran at Bladensburg were from Baltimore. So, <laughs> um, but my, my sense is that the, the Americans who fought uh, at Bladensburg, uh, these were largely uh, tradesmen, farmers, militiamen. Actually, Francis Scott Key was there. He had joined uh, the militia despite his opposition to the war. He, like everyone else, uh, felt they, they needed to defend uh, their, their homes. He wasn't uh, in uniform that day, but he uh, contributed to the confusion, at least, uh, as I describe in the book. But these, these troops, uh, I think, when we think about going up against the professional army, Wellington's veterans, uh, I, I wonder today if, if suddenly an, an army was marching on, on Washington, how well uh, we do, if citizen soldiers uh, marching out and, and trying to stand up to this uh, veteran, well-commanded force. Um, I think the, the loss at Bladensburg was, was largely due to uh, poor command, not just General Winder, but all the way up to Madison. Um, and, and I uh, outlined some of those, um, those faults in the book. Um, that night, after the, the American forces are scattered, um, last brave stand by Joshua Barney, right at the district uh, Maryland line, uh, which offered the Americans a last chance to stop the British, but uh, it wasn't uh, supported by, by General Winder. Uh, the forces retreat through Washington. It's just absolute chaos. And as I mentioned, Winder ends up to uh, Tenley Town, and uh, as the British start to burn the city, and then he decided Tenley Town was too close for comfort, and he ended up going all the way out to Rockville. <laughs> uh, so um, it was, uh, and they, they could see the fires the entire way, uh, the, the fires that the British uh, lit that night. It's kind of remarkable to think of today. Washington at this time was basically a small village of uh, about 8,000 people with these amazing, beautiful edifices that were being built, uh, um, the Capitol still under construction was, was probably the most magnificent, uh, particularly the House Chamber was the most glorious building in America at that time. The, uh, the White House had, had just 
uh, essentially been completed and uh, was, of course, uh, it was called the President's House then, but it was uh, likewise uh, something that was being built for the ages. And uh, within uh, a few hours of the British arrival into the, essentially a, an abandoned city, those, uh, those buildings were all in flames. The, the Washington Navy Yard, which filled, of course, with uh, lumber, tar, ships, uh, just the Americans actually ended up uh, burning that themselves to keep it from falling in British hands. But as Admiral Coburn said, uh, he was glad the Americans did it because it saved him the trouble. <laughs> so it was uh, the, the sites, uh, uh, looking at some of the witness accounts that uh, uh, letters and so forth that I looked at uh, describe people being able to see the, uh, the burning uh, from Frederick or from Fredericksburg. Leesburg in Baltimore, they're able to see the, the sky lit up. It, was, it must have been just a remarkable sight. And it was something that certainly people who saw it never forgot. The British, uh, this, this was a force of 4,000 folks. Uh, they weren't sure whether the Americans were going to launch a, a counterattack. They couldn't imagine that uh, the Americans would completely abandon the city. I mean, they, would, they didn't know that uh, Winder had gone all the way to uh, Rockville. They, they assumed he was still up in Georgetown, and uh, this small expeditionary force needed to regroup and uh, get back to the ships. They had actually suffered uh, a lot more casualties than the Americans because they had been charging into heavy artillery fire from, from Barney's guns. And um, you know, one of the, the side stories of this this uh, this whole episode is that a tornado actually hits town right. Uh, <laughs> right uh, the, the next day as the British are, are continuing some of the destruction of the, the public buildings. And this um, did a lot more damage probably to the Americans than, than the British, but it did precipitate uh, a, a hurried departure from the city, uh, probably saved the, the Georgetown foundry, which was a, a critical uh, point for uh, uh, American armaments. So the, uh, the British retreated after uh, just 24 hours in the city back to their ships. And one of the great uh, unanswered questions about uh, the, the whole um, um, episode here is the British could have gone on to Baltimore directly from, from Washington by land. It's, it's generally been thought that they never really uh, considered that. But one of the, um, the documents that uh, I uncovered along with uh, John McCavitt, who's a, an Irish scholar who's, who's working on a biography of General Ross, uh, it's a memorandum by one of his officers that shows that they actually seriously considered going directly overland from Washington to Baltimore uh, and taking the city by surprise. And there's little doubt, had they done so, that uh, Baltimore would have fallen. Baltimore's defenses were all, at that point, uh, based on a uh, defense from the water. They weren't prepared at all for a land attack. And the city was actually in, on the verge of capitulation anyway because uh, news of Washington's fall had, had reached there. The, the militia from Baltimore had scattered back there and uh, basically said, run for your lives. And it was only this very critical British delay in attacking Baltimore that, that really ended up saving uh, that city. And this, uh, uh, one of the reasons for the delay was uh, the, the, own, the British's own greed. They, uh, they had another squadron going up to Alexandria, and um, the, that squadron didn't reach Alexandria until the British Army was already retreating from Washington. So you had this entire other force, uh, which had a lot of the bombardment equipment for the British uh, that they would need to attack Baltimore, was too busy filling the, the ships with all the loot from the Alexandria warehouses, and, and took three or four days to do that. And this uh, further delayed uh, the British attack. So the British retreat to their ships, uh, spend a couple of weeks debating what to do next. Coburn and Ross, the, the real firebrands, were urging an immediate attack on Baltimore. But Ad Admiral Cochran really wanted to, to uh, save the force for an attack on New Orleans. He was afraid that, uh, he was also afraid of the um, onset of uh, disease in, uh, you know, the August, September time frame in the Chesapeake. Um, they'd had problems with uh, fevers the year before and, uh, malaria um, and other diseases that uh, were quite mysterious. Um, and they wanted to get out of there and head north 
wait a couple months and then go attack New Orleans. But then at the last minute, they decide to launch this attack on Baltimore anyway. And I go into some of the reasons for that. Um, this delay had allowed uh, the United States a chance to regroup. And you know, the initial fear that had um, swept the East Coast that Washington fall and Baltimore would be next, probably Philadelphia and New York wouldn't be much behind. Um, there, there was a, a couple of weeks there where uh, more reason set in, and uh, reason and also the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy sent uh, some of its best um, officers, including John Rogers, Oliver Hazard Perry, um, David Porter helped set up defenses in Baltimore along with some of their very experienced naval gunners. And they were manning some of the guns that were supporting Fort McHenry. And this, uh, this would make a huge difference when the, the British launched their attack uh, September 12th of 1814. They'd, they'd gathered the Patapsco River and they launched a dual assault uh, army landing again uh, at North Point and attacking by, by land, and then the, the bombardment squadron going up to attack the city. But to get to the city, they would have to get past Fort McHenry. Um, Francis Scott Key uh, was not beamed down from outer space uh, to witness this. Uh, his, his entire um, adventure getting to, to Baltimore is uh, a story in itself. Uh, uh, he had, he'd been he launched on a mission to, to rescue uh, an elderly doctor who had been taken prisoner by the British family friend and key as, a, as one of those quintessential Washington attorneys that we all make fun of today was, was uh, the man that they went to uh, as a well-connected attorney with the connections with the government, a good negotiator um, uh, to, to try to rescue this doctor. And he ends up f finding the British fleet, sailing to the British fleet and joining them just as they're turning to attack Baltimore. And uh, he ends up then witnessing this, this attack. And you had this uh, uh, devout opponent of the war um, who's uh, witnessing uh, what was really a, a remarkable bombardment, 24 hours, um, some 1,500 bombs, um, hundreds of rockets as well. When we, when we talk about the, the rockets and, and the bombs, this is not uh, hyperbole. Um, and he had seen the flag, of course, during the day flying over F Fort McHenry, and a uh, ferocious storm had hit during that afternoon. Uh, you know, it's funny, a couple times now when I've had book events, there have been ferocious storms. And <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, the uh, tropical storm didn't seem to be quite as, as fierce as, as feared. But um, the, um, this, he's, he's witnessing the attack through this uh, lightning, through the uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of bombs and, and uh, uh, shells that are being launched at Fort McHenry, and he's really not sure what he's going to see when, when the morning comes. At least the, um, the continued bombardment is, is proof enough that the, the fort had still, uh, was still standing, that the American flag would be there. But then before dawn, there's a, there's a quiet, and uh, the, the British had, had launched uh, their fiercest attack after midnight. It was actually a diversion that was meant to uh, allow the, the, the land troops who were attacking uh, from the other direction, um, who had landed at North Point, uh, trying to give them a diversion so they could uh, break through the militia lines at Hempstead Hill, which is today uh, Patterson Park. So he, he's watching this all night, and his verse uh, really has to be viewed a, as a long question. He's not sure that the, uh, <coughs> that the American Republic would, would survive. and. Uh, his emotion the next morning uh, as the, as the um, mist clears and he's able to see the flag is, uh, is really uh, captured quite well in that verse, um, which I, I s like to compare to, um, of course, there's no photography then, but he painted an image with his words that were immediately printed in newspapers around the country. And it, I think it was pretty similar to, to what uh, the, the photograph of the flag being raised at Iwo Jima by the Marines, uh, or the uh, the flags that were um, um, put up at uh, uh, 
World Trade Center and uh, the Pentagon after 9-11, these, uh, these symbols. The American flag really wasn't uh, an enormous symbol for Americans until Key's song came along. And this was the first um, moment that really brought it to a, a new prominence. Uh, it was more of a military signal at that point, and uh, the flag took on a, a meaning um, that began with Key's song that, of course, has continued to this day. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, what, uh, what was our relationship with Canada? What were our troops doing in Canada, and how did all that end? <laughs> well, the, the common uh, belief was that uh, we were going to be greeted as liberators in Canada when we invaded. Uh, this is what Thomas Jefferson, uh, former president, uh, assured Madison, and uh, it's what all the war hawks, Henry Clay said, you know, we can take Quebec with, uh, you know, one, uh, one battalion of Kentucky militia. And that didn't happen. Um, the Canadians uh, had a, um, apart from, of course, Quebec, it was thought that because uh, the, the French settlers there would be hostile to the, um, to the British, but it turned out they didn't like having Quebec invaded by another country. Uh, who, who would have thought that? The, uh, and um, uh, essentially, it, our, our own militia and uh, U.S. Army forces that were sent into uh, Canada uh, were poorly trained and, and poorly uh, equipped and poorly led. And those uh, attacks went nowhere. The, um, for Canada, the, you know, this, this war was uh, an enormous victory. I mean, there's no way that if you, if you rank all the different um, participants in the war, you'd have to say that Canada probably has the best claim to winning this war. Um, and between uh, Great Britain and the United States, it's a bit of a toss-up. Um, the uh, United States was able to emerge with um, um, it, a new found sovereignty and a, a, a sense of union that hadn't existed before. Uh, the war. Great Britain was able to maintain something of its position in North America, but n not um, under the terms it would have liked. But for, for Canada, the War of 1812 was, was the, the moment that really set it uh, on its route to eventual independence. And uh, they're, they're observing the bicentennial up there with great fervor, uh, the, the, the victory over the Americans. And uh, who can deny them that? You know, the, they, they didn't call it the War of 1812 at the time. Um, it, was, it was called the war, primarily. Um, it was uh, after the war, it was called um, the late war, the war with, um, the second war with Great Britain. The, the term uh, second war of independence was used as well um, because uh, a lot of Americans at the time, particularly after it was over, felt that it had uh, established our, the first, uh, the revolution had established our freedom, but th this war had, had really established our independence. Um, the uh, the term War of 1812 was used by a historian, those guys. You know, <laughs> um, and it essentially, um, it didn't come into popular use until the Mexican War. And suddenly, they couldn't call the War of 1812, you know, the late war, because now there was another war in between. So they had to sort of distinguish it. and. War of 1812 had been used um, um, by one of the historians of the war, and, and this became the, the favored term over the years, particularly by the time the Civil War came around. And you know, one of the interesting things is that the, the War of 1812, as we call it today, was a very dominant um, war in the American um, collective memory up until the time of the Civil War. Um, and certainly a lot of the, the um, the veterans of, of the Civil War uh, would later see the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, its real rise to become uh, eventually our national anthem uh, was fueled by the Civil War because when you think about it, um, these the Union troops were uh, fighting to, to defend um, after an American fort had been shelled and attacked by uh, the Confederates. You know, the, the parallels between Fort Sumter and Fort McHenry were pretty obvious for all to see. And, and the Star Spangled Banner became hugely popular uh, with American troops, uh, Union troops, both during the war, but particularly after the war. And, th and that's, uh, that said it's on, on its path. But I, yeah, I really feel like uh, we, we could have come up with a better name than the War of 1812. <laughs>
I, I've got a question for you, but um, I first have to um, just make a pitch. Um, I live on the battlefield of the Battle of Bladensburg, and uh, at the Bladensburg Waterfront Park on the Anacostia River um, in the last year, a visitor center about the Battle of Bladensburg has been um, established. Not very well known yet, but uh, it's, worth a, it's worth a visit. Uh, I was surprised in your narrative of the Battle of Bladensburg that you didn't say a little bit more about the role of uh, Commodore Barney. He seems like the one uh, unmitigated American hero um, of the battle, and I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about Barney and about his role um, that day. Yeah, absolutely, and and uh, I, I give Barney his his uh, his due in the in the book. Um, Barney, you know, it's interesting. There there are a couple things. Uh, Coburn used Barney very uh, cleverly. He was able to, to use Barney's um, flotilla to disguise his, his movement towards, towards Washington. So the flotilla um, as a force didn't, wasn't very effective in, in slowing down the, the British, uh, uh, the Royal Navy from, from its uh, advances. But where Barney uh, and his men proved really effective was at Bladensburg. Um, the, uh, when the British trapped the flotilla uh, at Pig Point uh, there on the Patuxent River, Barney basically had rigged the boats to go up and explode as the British uh, uh, advanced. And so the British were quite disappointed because Barney and, and his 450 flotilla men escaped. They were able to destroy the flotilla, but um, the, the men, which were the real power of that force, um, got away. And uh, Barney, again, General Winder, the American commander, uh, he didn't have uh, necessarily direct control over uh, Barney because Barney reported to the Navy and, and Winder was a, a militia commander, but he made, still, he made no real use of uh, Barney's force, which was the, the best fighting force. They were augmented uh, by 120 Marines as well. Uh, so you had a, a pretty powerful American force that set up the third line uh, right we're at the district um, Maryland line there, you know, where where Eastern, Blaine, Avenue, Eastern Avenue. Avenue. Yeah, I mean, it's just, in fact, uh, just a quick segue. Um, during the research for this book, um, uh, I brought my kids out to an archaeological dig that was going on there, right, uh, Eastern Avenue, next to the, you know, the Popeyes and the the car break shop and all that. And it's mm -hmm. you wouldn't think that uh, that landscape could had have so much. Uh, Amazing history, but it does, and and my, my kids actually got to you know dig there in the in the in the dirt and <laughs> find help find a, a slate uh, floor. They were trying to figure out where Barney's line was anchored because there's descriptions of Barney's uh, line being anchored on a on a barn up there, and they were trying to find that barn. Um, but yeah, the the, the fight that uh, Barney uh, put up, he he had um, um, these. Um, 18-pound guns, uh, very powerful artillery, and the British force was coming up. You look at the landscape there, it really helps being out there at Bladensburg to, to see this. Uh, the British had to come up, uh, tack uphill to the, to the American line there. And, and uh, the, uh, some of the British accounts uh, written by uh, officers and uh, uh, some of the, the Royal Marines as well just describe this as being more fierce than any fighting they'd seen in France. I mean, just a, a, a really ferocious fire that was uh, leveled by, by Barney and uh, the Marines. But they weren't backed up uh, well by the uh, militia, and they didn't uh, have enough ammunition to keep this up forever. And, and eventually, Ross was able to basically flank Barney. Barney was, uh, was terribly wounded. A lot of uh, those Americans took when we talk about all the Americans fleeing for their lives, well, the, those flotilla men uh, didn't flee, and they, they, and the Marines didn't flee, and they took, um, you know, 25 percent plus casualties. So, uh, what you're doing in Bladensburg is just fantastic. The, the, the memorial uh, that's being planned, the waterfront park there is just terrific. <coughs> it's, you know, it's amazing because I, one of the reasons I, I was so frustrated about the lack of history around here. I remember, you know, growing up, I used to have this pontoon boat, and back in the 1980s, my, my friends and I took it up uh, the Anacostia River all the way to Bladensburg. It's hard to do because it's uh, so silted over, but if you, if you time it right with the, the tide, you can do it. And we got up there, 
and we're thinking, oh, Bladensburg, this is where the British, you know, it, attacked. And we, we couldn't find anything uh, really to mark that. The only thing we saw was the captain's go-go, which <laughs> I'm not sure if it's still there. But um, yeah, it's, it's terrific, um, uh, the bicentennial preparations uh, that are going on there. I think it's going to be a, a big deal next year. Could you please comment briefly on the degree to which the French were rejoicing as this war went on? <laughs> You know, um, for a long time, we, we, um, we couldn't decide who to declare war on. Um, there was a, there was a, a lot of um, folks in, in uh, the United States and the government who thought that the United States should be declaring war on France, not, not Great Britain. Uh, certainly, one of the interesting things about this whole tale uh, is that Napoleon was, was quite grateful that the Americans had uh, uh, declared war on, on the British. And, and uh, there's an epilogue of the book. I describe how Admiral Coburn, um, after his reign of terror in, in, uh, in the United States, um, was quite ce uh, celebrated in, in um, Great Britain. He wasn't held, he wasn't responsible for New Orleans. He didn't take part of that. So he, was, uh, he emerged as quite a naval hero. And uh, after Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, um, the British wanted to make sure that Napoleon did not escape a second time. And the man that they gave the, jo the job to taking uh, Napoleon down to um, St. Helen Helena Island in the, um, the middle of the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean there off the coast of Africa was uh, George Coburn. As soon as he got back to England, he thought that the war was over. And they said, no, you're taking Napoleon down. But they would, they would have to eat together. It took 70 days to sail down there. And every night uh, you know, at, the, um, at the admiral's table there, Napoleon would ruminate about different things about uh, the whole war. And one of the things he, he told Coburn was that I kept waiting for uh, President Madison to send me a request for um, French Navy to support the Americans. If I never got the request, I would have been happy to send them some ships of the line. And uh, it, that, uh, to me, is an intriguing uh, little side uh, or footnote to this whole story. The, the Americans uh, didn't probably do enough to take advantage of uh, what support the French could, could offer.